your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potstirrer Podcast. Welcome to Potstirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. Today, we have a special guest, Maureen O'Connell, Ph.D. Maureen is an associate professor of Christian ethics at LaSalle University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is the author of books such as Compassion, Loving Our Neighbor in an Age of Globalization, and If These Walls Could Talk, Community Muralism and the Beauty of Justice. In addition, she is the member of Power, Philadelphians Organizing to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild an interfaith coalition of more than 50 congregations committed to making Philadelphia the city of just love through faith-based community organizing. Maureen is here to discuss her research, and in particular, her new book, Undoing the Knots, Five Generations of American Catholic Anti-Blackness. Welcome, Maureen, to Pastor Podcast. Jay, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really, really excited to have a conversation with you. I'm really excited as well. Um, So let's get started. What inspired you to pursue your line of research? And in particular, what led you to writing Undoing the Knots? Sure, that's a great, a great, good first question. So I think um, part of this research came from the, this, my second book, which was on muralism here in the city of Philadelphia. So a lot of people might not know that Philadelphia is the mural capital of the world. We have more than 5,000 community murals all over the city of Philadelphia. So I did a book that looked at those as, um, looked at murals that were done by faith communities or that had religious imagery. And I looked at them as sort of sacred texts and prophetic texts, and also as ways of engaging with social problems using the arts, entrenched social problems that cities like Philadelphia face using the arts. And in doing that research day, I ended up traveling all over the city, hunting around for murals, going with my mom, actually as sort of my co-pilot, trying to find the different, different walls around the city where these neighborhoods were located. And in doing that hunting, um, and I ended up calling those kind of pilgrimages because they kind of became these sacred journeys going to look for the inbreaking of God and these beautiful images in these communities my mother would point out like, oh, that church is, you know, the church that your great grandparents got married in, or, you know, um, this is the church that your great grandparents on your father's side got married in, or this is the church where I was baptized. And it was just sort of interesting to kind of learn or kind of awaken to the connections that my family had in the landscape of the city. And that all of that came from their Catholic identity and belonging to these different parishes that we had not been connected to for a very long time. And so I really started to wonder how it was that we got disconnected um, and how our disconnection or how our separation or our segregation, quite frankly, from different neighborhoods in the city impacted us, but also impacted the folks who didn't have the option to um, move beyond those neighborhoods or move out of those neighborhoods. So there was a very concrete moment when I, I brought a group of people on a on a other people on a mural pilgrimage and um, was talking with them and kind of knew that this was my grandparents' neighborhood. But all of a sudden, as I was standing in front of this one mural, had this very profound sense that my grandparents actually lived right across the street from this mural, like cat a quarter to the mural. And all of a sudden, I felt this simultaneous sense of deep connection to that place because I knew that it was a space that my family's history had unfolded. And yet I felt like a total outsider. And I knew that 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 feeling, there was something about race and there was something about the interplay of our Catholic identity and our racial identity that gave rise to that simultaneous sense of belonging and and being disconnected or being an outsider. So that's really kind of where it started. And I just said, okay, I want to know where we were in different places in the city and at different times and what was going on there and how how, you know, how did this separation and disconnection, not just from the spaces, but from, from people in the city happen? Hmm. I just find that really fascinating, just the tie-in with 
reflecting your family history in the flesh. And then that kind of jogs their thought process. And it's like, okay, well, you start asking the why questions. I can really identify with that a lot. I think of like growing up in Detroit, my dad was like raised in Detroit and lived in Detroit almost all his life. And we would just ride around and he would point out different landmarks. For example, Black Bottom, which is a neighborhood in Detroit that was an all black neighborhood back in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about like how it was named and what it was like and all of that. And then learning as I got older, like that neighborhood, how that ended up torn apart because of the freeways. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Like there was a lot of decision making that had to do with race that was involved in that. Yes. So, you know, but yeah, but I think it's just really neat to have that you learn from your family and you kind of start asking those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, I hear you. I mean, I think, you know, the why question is, is really, really important. And I think for me, it was something that helped is something that I'm trying to, you know, accomplish with the with the book. So, you know, many folks of European descent, and I would imagine, you know, places of other origin do the ancestry research, right? European people of European descent, and particularly Catholics, have this benefit of being able to go back very far because the church kept records about us and and we matter. And we know that it's not as easy for let's say black Americans or indigenous Americans or Hispanic Americans to go back and try to do that kind of same genealogical research. But I did want to sort of put some context, some like flesh on the bones of, of that tree, of that family tree. It was like not enough just to sort of discover documents and, and, and build a timeline. I really, I think having been moving through the, the, the parishes and some of the parishes now in the city are closed, some of them are still open. But like, it was the combination of rooting that tree in particular places in the city of Philadelphia. So kind of like your father's experience of Black Bottom taking you to Black Bottom and saying like, look, this was an actual place and there was an actual kind of ecosystem that happened that our trees were planted or grew or or maybe were mowed down in those spaces. Asking the why questions about our histories as opposed to just sort of seeing them flat and one dimensional um, was really ex- like important. It was a kind of question that came to me. And I think it's because that question came also out of the context of the arts. So like, I know that Detroit has such a rich history of all sorts of really neat public and prophetic art. And so like, I'm deeply grateful to the, to the muralists and the communities that create that art, because I do think they expand our imaginations in lots of unexpected directions. And that's certainly what happened to me um, as a result of doing some of that mural hunting. But the why question I do think is really important. And if we don't, and when I say we here, I'm speaking really primarily of white Catholics, and that's who the primary audience for the book is. If we're not asking why certain things happened or why our families made certain decisions that we make, I don't think we have the whole picture of our family's connection to such a central facet of the American story, which is, you know, the facet of, of racism and the facet of, of white supremacy in the United States. And we just don't have a lot of courage for doing that because we haven't had a lot of examples of people doing it and doing it consistently and well. And I saw that repeatedly, even in the history of my family. So, yeah. So speaking of all that history and also the engagement with your family. So in terms of the book overall, you're talking about five generations of your family and then people who were around them or in those communities during that time and how they engaged race as Irish Catholics in the U S you know, specifically in Philadelphia. Yes. So you start out in the book talking about an incident that happened during your own lifetime and mine as well, which was the move bombing. The movement or move was a Black liberation and communal living movement founded in Philadelphia in 1972. The group melded principles of Black militancy and liberation with ecological and animal rights advocacy, and as a result, were involved in several clashes with law enforcement. This ongoing conflict and targeting by police culminated in the 1985 MOVE incident. Yes. 
The incident, or attack, was the result of an effort made by the Philadelphia police to evict the occupants of a row house in a middle-class black neighborhood in West Philadelphia, where many MOVE members lived communally with their children. This raid involved the police using thousands of rounds of ammunition to shoot into the home, and then subsequently bombing it from above. The bombing set off a fire that spread to several other homes in the neighborhood, which was a result of the fire department being ordered to stand down. When it was all said and done, 11 people lost their lives, including six children, 61 homes were destroyed, and 253 residents were left homeless. Now, one of the things that stuck out to me when you discussed this is this juxtaposition between the visual of the orange sky the day yeah. the incident happened. Yes, yes. And, and then the aftermath. Yeah. So, you know, this was a major event in the city. And yes. when this was happening, your father had the presence of mind to bring you and your sister to watch at, you know, at least from a distance. From a distance, yeah. And, and, yep. and it was like he had the presence of mind to see like, hmm, this might be a big deal. But then after that day, at least in the white Catholic circles that you were part of as a child, this wasn't really talked about. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, what impact did this event have on you? And what degree did it play a role in your later research and work? Yeah, that's a, such a great question. I mean, I was really little. I think, you know, I was 12 um, and my dad did get us out, my sister and I out of bed. And I do have a memory because I mean, when you're little, there are things that sort of stand out. So dad coming in and being like, get in the car in your pajamas and we're going to, we were in the suburbs and we were at a high point in the suburbs. So you could kind of see down into the city and, you know, he did have the wherewithal. Um, And I think in some ways it's, the story is kind of emblematic because we were in proximity. I mean, not super close proximity, but we were proximate. We were witnesses. And I think that is one theme that was repeated as I went back as early as the 1820s in these different parishes that my my family were in, that we were witnesses to some real horrific things that happened to Black people in particular. And we saw it. And there was something like, as you said, like we should be witnesses to this. There was a sense of not necessarily turning a blind eye in this case, although there were a lot of other historical cases of turning a blind eye, but then not really doing anything with what it was that we had witnessed, what it was that we had been sort of um, aroused from sleep as children to see. And so I think it was actually incredibly uh, nightmarish, uh, you know, quite frankly, and it captivated lots of people in the city in a similar way. I was just talking with a friend who is at another institution And she was just a little bit older than me. And she was like, I totally remember that day. I remember watching the television. I remember everybody kind of witnessing it. And then it's the silence that follows. And I think that is the biggest knot that I think keeps in, you know, many, many white communities, but let's say particularly Catholic communities closed in on ourselves and fearful and not able to really do anything with or anything about, or not feeling as though we can do anything with or about what it is that we have seen, sort of the responses, well, you say some prayers for those folks, um, and then you move on trying to live your life as justly as you can and and do your own individual work. Um, But there there was no sense of a collective. And I don't know that there has still even yet been a kind of collective reckoning in the city of Philadelphia, for sure, but within the Catholic archdiocese about that event. So I think, to be honest, it was sort of the combination of of witnessing extreme trauma and then the response to that being a kind of silence and maybe even a kind of polite silence as being incredibly disempowering and something that we learned. So we learned as children, like you don't ask questions about that because who knows what that was. And you, you don't ask questions, certainly why questions. And I think the thing about it, Jay, is that it was one of many one of two things that happened to me in my formative years that I think impacted my psyche and probably without me knowing it, were gently turning me constantly in my own formation as a theologian, in my own doctoral program, and in the years immediately after my doctoral program to take up questions of racial equity and racial justice in the Catholic church. Um, Because we are, as a as a um, denomination of Christianity, collectively, we have been very, very slow to do that. So I do think that was one 
of two experiences that really quietly formed my vocation because it was a kind of a kind of silence that I've come now to recognize as being incredibly incredibly deadly quite frankly for for communities of color um, and for people of color that I now through through work and through um, my vocation and through my affiliation with my with my parish I've come to know and care deeply about and love and I realize that silence is just not is not an option, but that is certainly the learned response, at least in my experience um, as a Catholic, a white Catholic. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things that you brought up is the Catholic church and its role in that racial history in Philadelphia. Yes. Yes. It's something that fascinates me. Like I'm not Catholic myself, but I did grow up attending Catholic schools and I graduated from a Catholic all girls high school mm. in Detroit that was run okay. by the, by the Adrian Dominican sisters. Okay. And, you know, I live in Cincinnati and like the plurality of religious people here are Catholic and it's a very conservative type of Catholicism mm-hmm. and it has a lot of social influence. So given my own personal background, I find the intersection of Catholicism and race fascinating. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in your own historical examination and research, what were a couple of ways that the Catholic Church facilitated the Irish Catholic community's assimilation or claim to whiteness? And I should say as a disclaimer, like I'm not a historian by training. So like this was a foray into all sorts of things. I'm an ethicist, but in trying to do this history, I had to do a lot of a reading of American Catholic history myself. But I can think of a couple moments that I think are are significant. Certainly, there was, and this would be true of the Catholic uh, Church's encounter with people outside of Europe in general, but it, it was it also applies to North America. There was a kind of missionary sensibility that the Catholic Church brought with it to the Americas, and I think that missionary sensibility sees anything other than European as deficient and through a lens of need and through a lens of, of charity. And so, and that's, that's kind of putting it very kindly, right? That we know there was an extreme amount of violence that happened through Catholic missionary endeavors. I'm really indebted to somebody maybe you'll want to talk to down the road by the name of Willie James Jennings, who sort of talks about the missionary performing a particular kind of role in the colonial period, um, sort of blessing the kind of violence that happened by the the merchants or the folks who were engaged in exploration for the sake of commerce and for the sake of a of a growing global economy. So I think that that missionary sensibility, seeing people who are not European as deficient as as in need, only through the lens of need, and responding to them mostly through charity, and never really sort of acknowledging them wholly as members of the church or allowing their experience and rich experience of Catholicism to shape Catholicism itself, always sort of extending a welcome into spaces when we move out of that missionary sensibility, but never really thinking of those spaces as multicultural. So to my mind, that was that was a key, a key piece that my my people experienced in some of their earliest days that they were here in the United States, which was in the 1820s in Chester County outside of Philadelphia, which was still relatively undeveloped. And so that missionary outreach and that sense of of connecting to people, mostly through charity, I think was was very problematic and continues to kind of articulate what I, you know, I, I ended up shifting the title of the book to be more explicit. You know, it wasn't so much how we became white and assimilated to whiteness, It was how in the process of that assimilation, we became Mm anti-Black, right? So a missionary sensibility sort of sees something, you know, that there's something inherently wrong with Black people, you know? And so I really deeply appreciate Ibram Kendi's sense that, you know, that is the fundamental way of thinking about racism, that people assume that there is just something wrong with Black people, that Black people are a problem that needs to be solved. So I think that that was one, that was one thread that got carried through. I think a second place, Jay, where I saw this at different points in the in the history, and this is where this would be something that could be specifically Catholic, but 
or I couldn't help but read the church's defensive stance against anti-Catholicism at different points in the history, particularly the history of Philadelphia, as kind of offering cover for a way of also being anti-Black. So again, it is that desire to assimilate and the fear, the fear of kind of being seen, Catholics being seen by the, you know, the, the, the dominant Protestant culture themselves as other. And the best way you kind of become not other is to continually otherize another group. And so in order to kind of protect itself from claims of anti-Catholicism, in order to defend itself against the anti-Catholic attitudes and, and discrimination, the church really took what I kind of came to recognize in my research, a sort of a self-preservationist stance, where putting the good of the institutional church over and above the, the people who made up that church happened pretty repeatedly. Or another way I've kind of come to talk about it is, an, a, is a preferential option for the institutional church as opposed to the preferential option for the poor, which is at the heart of Catholic social teaching, many times the church opted to protect itself institutionally rather than stand in solidarity with the people, even in its own membership, right? Even among the black and brown Catholics that made up the church in Philadelphia. And so I saw that an awful lot. And I think that that is something that is sort of distinctively Catholic. And I think we still see because a lot of, you'll often hear a Catholic rejoinder, a white Catholic rejoinder to any kind of call for self-examination about race within the church, you'll often hear people say, well, Catholics were discriminated against as well. And I think there is truth to that, but it was oh, the yeah. rare opportunity or the, not the rare opportunity, the rare instance where that discrimination was converted into a kind of solidarity with others who were discriminated too often that discrimination was converted into. So therefore we have to protect our neighborhoods from the quote unquote incursion of black people, or we need to protect our schools from the arrival of black students because, you know, somehow the quality of our institutions will be called into question if we allow blacks, if we admit black students into our colleges and universities. So there was that, to my mind, that's a complicated thing that I want to continue to explore a little bit. Mm -hmm. It really makes me think of the work of a number of social science scholars like David Rediger and yes. Noel Ignatiev. I did a lot of reading of the two of them myself. Yeah. Yeah. And fascinating. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Because they both get into this construction of whiteness. And like yes. when we talk about whiteness, we're not just talking about like white skin. We're yeah. talking about a whole system, the whole system of a racial order. Yeah. Kind of like you talked about, like that otherizes certain groups for the benefit of the dominant group. Part of assimilation is, okay, when you're taking that position, part of that is stomping on the heads of those yes. who are considered at the bottom. Yeah. Or that your admittance or your ability to join one group is predicated on another's not inability to do the same. Mm -hmm. Right. It's only so valuable if it can't be if it, it's not something that's accessible to others. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I did a lot of work with Rodiger on on work in a chapter where I looked at um, one strain of my family, one one branch of the tree, I guess I should say, that came from rural Chester County, which was in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, one of the surrounding counties and moved into Philadelphia. So second generation Irish and made the decision to move into the city and mostly because he was he was a an iron molder and there was lots of there was lots of opportunity and lots of work and you know he would have as a second generation irish he would have had a leg up on some of the more you know the newer arrivals who were trying to you know elbow their way into work and competing with black workers but his work would have had a particular kind of value because it was something that he, you know, that he freely chose and it, it had value because it was associated with whiteness. Whereas let's say the workers, you know, right after reconstruction, black workers, you know, yes, now are free, are free laborers, but their blackness still associates them with a kind of devalued labor that it doesn't matter if they were free or not black labor because of blackness was associated with a kind of 
servility was associated with a kind of with lower with lower wages. It was less dignified work simply because it was black. That chapter is called manufacturing, and so just trying to explore some of the dynamics there. And interestingly enough, you know, all of those dynamics are playing out right as the institutional Catholic Church in Rome is thinking through its first social teaching on workers and the dignity of work, right? And so I'm trying to think, well, I've always thought when I've, you know, that's one of the first social encyclicals as, you know, a social ethicist, it was one of the first that I studied, Rerum Novarum. I always read Rerum Novarum through a sort of European lens and was always thinking about Rerum Novarum in terms of the context of work among European workers in cities all over Europe, not really thinking about the implications of that in America or in a city like Philadelphia. And part of the reason I wouldn't have thought about that necessarily is because there wasn't an, a, a hierarchical commitment among the U.S. bishops to translate that document into the context of work and the role of racism in, in work and in labor in the United States. You know, So again, that silence is something that keeps us from being able to critically engage and step up the way that we should be even today around issues of, of work and labor. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you mentioned that really resonated with me is this analogy that you gave in Undoing the Knots that illustrates how white people experience racism. Quote, somewhere in my ongoing journey towards anti-racism, I was exposed to an analogy whose source I no longer remember, that presents White's experience of racism as akin to being hermetically sealed by four walls, a wall of separation and isolation as a result of generations of segregation and housing, a wall of amnesia about history, a wall of illusions about our own innocence and delusions about the magnitude of racial disparities, and a wall of power and privileges awarded us by our pigmentation, end quote. Now, the thing about that that really struck me is just really thought about this analogy and I'm just like, okay, so walls protect, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they also trap. Yes. Those different forces that I, I see that illustrated in your book. Mm -hmm. And so since we are talking about the Catholic church, what are maybe one or two ways that you discovered in your research that the Catholic Church was negatively affected by its investment in whiteness? So I'll give you a thank you for that. And I have to say, like, I, I went back and talked to everybody who has ever any training that I was in. I, I did try to find the source of this quote because I do think of this analogy because I do think it's really, really helpful. And I mean, everybody's like, no, that wasn't me, but that's really great. <laughs> So I wish that I could attribute because it is very helpful. So, you know, I can give you two, two examples um, and both of them have to do with segregation, one in housing and one in education. So I do think that the, the church in walling and trying to wall itself off from the arrival of really refugees from the Jim Crow South in the Great Migration that impacts, obviously, you know this from your history and your background in, in Detroit, certainly would be the case in Cincinnati, cities like Philadelphia. Rather than figure out ways of creatively integrating, following gospel teaching, following church teaching, even institutional church teaching coming from the Vatican, Catholics took, in many instances, a very defensive posture. And so this one chapter in the book, I look at a parish that the Jesuits ran in North Philadelphia, the Jesu Parish. So two different branches of my family were in there at two, two different points. But in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, late 20s, 30s, and 40s, the Jesuits in that parish, in collaboration with lay people, and then interestingly enough, in a kind of ecumenical collective effort, tried very hard to keep Black people from moving into that neighborhood, from Black businesses from arriving in that neighborhood, Black churches arriving in that neighborhood, because there was this fear that this infrastructure, and they even say this in some of the communications that I read in the archives, you know, this infrastructure was valued at, you know, more than a million dollars, the physical plant, and like, it will all be, it will all be lost. And I do think that there could have been another way. And there were people in that parish who were advocating for another way of doing this. And one of those people was a contemporary of my great grandmother, 
And so there were people who were suggesting, no, we could integrate this parish. And wouldn't that parish actually perhaps have survived and thrived in a way if there had been commitments, if the Catholic Church in all of its different places across the city had made an an attempt at integration? I think in some ways we could ask ourselves if there would be more stability in general across the city like Philadelphia, if parishes would enjoy a bit more financial stability, social stability, political stability. So I think in trying to keep Black people out of parishes in the long run, I do think it ended up killing those parishes. And it ended up certainly harming the Black people who were either interested in becoming Catholic or who were Catholic themselves. And then in a way, that's going to have ripple effects across the, the social infrastructure of the archdiocese. So The second example would be in higher education, right? Similar attempts were made. There was a real reluctance to integrate universities like the one that I teach in now, LaSalle University. So in one of the chapters on the universities, like I came across some correspondence from Black Catholics to the president of LaSalle saying, we would like to send our Black sons to LaSalle University and the archbishop would like all Catholic parents to send their Catholic children to Catholic schools, but we can't do that if you won't admit them. And I think that that created its own instability in these institutions where now, you know, many Catholic institutions in Philadelphia are increasingly diverse. So my own institution, far more diverse than it would have been when I was I'm a product of Catholic higher ed in Philadelphia. Um, It's far more diverse than it was 25 or 30 years ago when I was a student, but that doesn't mean that we are multicultural. That does not mean that we are communities that are deeply inclusive. That does not mean that we are communities who know how to to do a kind of church and community in in a kind of multicultural way. In fact, we really don't. And we don't because the default has always sort of been we have inherited that historical default of wanting to somehow maintain the whiteness, whether we're explicit about this or implicit, maintain the whiteness of our institutions. And so that is coming at our own detriment Mm -hmm. um, right now in, in Catholic higher education, I think across the country. And I think we're doing a disservice in many ways to both the, the students of color who we welcome into our institutions, but our institutions are not sufficiently, they're still predominantly white institutions. And so that makes it very challenging for them in terms of succeeding, in terms of attaining a degree. And it also, we're not preparing as best we can our white students for a multicultural world that is very clearly always been a reality, but, you know, we can no longer pretend that's not the fact. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up. In Detroit, over the past, I want to say like 20 or 30 years, there has been an exodus of of Catholic schools from the city. Mm-hmm. And actually, it probably started even before then. But I remember in the past, like 20 or 30 years, because I was that was around the time that I was in school. It was, it was like 20, 30 years ago when I was in grade school, in, in high school. Yeah. Detroit has had a lot of racial animus and like there's yes. a lot of history yes. going way yes. back. But yeah. one of the things that happened is that in Detroit, technically in the 50s, it became more of a thing in the late 60s, 70s, 80s was white flight. Yes. And when that happened, a lot of the Catholic institutions went with Mm -hmm. the white population. Yes. There were very few that stayed behind. There was one that I recall that is still there, um, University of Detroit which is yes. a, it's yes. been there. Yep. Yeah. And mm-hmm. like, so, you know, so there's, there's university of Detroit high school, which is an all boys institution. Then there's the university, university. of Detroit mercy. Yeah. Yes. Which, you know, which is the, the college. And yep. the thing is, is that a lot of high schools and a lot of K through 12 in general left U of D made a point to say we're staying. Yeah. Yep. And I think for them, it made a difference because I'd yes. had, I noticed that for them is like one of the few places you see that have white students that are there with black students, you know, instead of them just kind of leaving with everybody else. Yes. Yeah. You know? But in general, yeah. a lot of the schools either moved or in the case of the high school I went to, they closed. 
Yeah. Yeah. In a, that's in, a very similar story. Yep. Yeah. And so that pretty much it all but eliminated the Catholic presence in the city. Yes. It hurts the church in terms of diversity, in terms of how Black people see the church, you know, including like Black Catholics, how they see the church and, and how included they feel within yes. the church. Yes. You know? Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, you you put your finger on something, Jay, that I think is important that there is, there were institutions, there were Catholic institutions and Catholic individuals who had a different vision, who had a different sensibility, who were much more intentional about whether it was interracial justice was kind of the language that was used in the 40s and the 50s. And it has its own problems and its own problematic history. But there, there were, and that was one of the things that I encountered in doing this research. There were people much like the University of Detroit Mercy, who were pointing to and living um, and witnessing to a different way. And one that for them and for the communities they were a part of was a very just one and a very life-giving one. And they just didn't capture the imagination, the social imagination of of folks in other parts in in the institutional hierarchy in the diocese, you know? We have inherited both the impacts of those decisions but also many of the mindsets that justified them. So, and so part of wanting to do this history, when white Catholics don't remember our history completely, when we hide behind that wall of amnesia, right, of not knowing our history, we're both not able to be honest about our failings and our shortcomings and our collusion. Our, you know, it wasn't a passive becoming white. In many instances, there were, you know, a lot of active commitments to being anti-Black in the history of the institutional church and of Catholics, if we aren't able to acknowledge that, we are not going to be able to um, appropriately confess that individually and collectively. We are not going to be able to live into a different way forward. We're not going to be able to undo those knots. But the other thing that happens behind that wall of amnesia is we forget all of the prophetic figures, both Black and white, in our tradition who were really were living a different way, who were living the gospel, who we today could turn to, to look at as we try to figure out, well, how do we want to think about housing on campus? How do we want to think about our curriculum? How do we want to think about, you know, right now we're in the process of, of, a, of a global synod. Who do we want to be listening to? How do we even go about doing that kind of listening to people who you know, are not from our inner circle of sameness. So we've forgotten all of those folks too, at a time when we most need the wisdom of their, of their lived experience, the wisdom of their holiness in this regard. So I was really, you know, happy to have encountered some of those ideas and lift and those people. And I tried to incorporate them in the book as well, because I would imagine in all of our families, we have some of those figures. Oh yeah. I understand that within the book, And outside of that, in your general research and life, you used and engaged with critical race theory. Yes. A core issue that you present in the book is that often white Catholics and this and it's not just white Catholics, but also white Americans generally can feel uncomfortable and get defensive when encountering conflict or pushback from people of color on race related issues. Yeah. Say if you're wanting to talk about critical race theory more directly or just talking about anti-racism or Mm. even discussing race related issues in general. What would you say to those who bristle at the idea due to concerns over, say, white guilt or the possibility of conflict or being told by people of color that they're doing it wrong? Yeah. Such a great, great question. I think I would say two things. I think I would encourage, and it's something I try to do myself and I try to do in the book, is to ask why. Why are we having those kinds of, I love that word that you use, bristle. I think that's like a very tame response or a very sort of moderated response. I think we see examples far more than just simply bristling. But I think the invitation here is to ask why, to get curious about why that is or where that might be coming from. And I suspect that part of the answer to that question is that this is new terrain, 
that being called to be aware of a racial identity is not something that white people have to do in any kind of regular basis because we know that sort of the this is coming back to some of the beginning of our conversation that whiteness is not just about necessarily skin color but the way in which our our society and our systems are set up to make whiteness sort of the norm so bristling at a kind of self-awareness that maybe we didn't seek but is kind of thrust upon us maybe rather than a kind of defensiveness, seeing that as an invitation for self-awareness and for growth. Or perhaps also sort of suggesting that, yeah, I don't think white guilt is, is the goal of this. I don't think that communities of color are looking for white guilt. I think what communities of color are asking for and inviting is white responsibility, white partnership, white accountability. And so, you know, the ethicist in me says guilt is not a healthy and helpful moral disposition. It keeps us locked on ourselves. It's very egotistical. It keeps us trapped in the past. It doesn't help us move forward. So, you know, trying to figure out ways to shift from guilt to a kind of a kind of responsibility. And there's a freedom that comes from that. It frees us from that cycle of bristling, which when we don't interrupt it, actually just simply intensifies. And I love the way you put this too, like, being told by people of color that you're doing it wrong, well, let's take a breath and say that's probably messaging that we know communities of color and people of color here explicitly and implicitly multiple times a week, if not multiple times a day. So how to allow that kind of feeling to create a kind of empathy as opposed to a continually and centering right on whiteness. And then I think the last thing I would say to this really good question, Jay, is I've I've been giving this some thought and I think in Catholic social teaching, we have central principles, right? And one of them is the preferential option for those who have been made poor. Um, And if we know one thing about race, we know that it functions to do that. We know that it functions to advantage some and disadvantage others. So couldn't we be looking at critical race theory as a kind of way of doing the preferential option that is talked about and that's, that comes to us from the Latin American bishops in the Catholic tradition who say, if you really want to understand what's going on in a social situation, you need to look at it from the perspective of the people who are closest to the pain of that injustice, um, because that's where enlightenment comes. That's where new insight comes. You need to be led by those people, the people closest to the pain, because they know the way they've lived in circumstances and they know what justice is. Um, we need to we need to follow their lead. And so in many ways, I think that that can be a way for Catholics to understand what we mean by critical race theory, which is basically let's start to look at some of these things from a perspective other than the dominant white perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's really helpful that you talked about some of this. I would agree. Like guilt is not the goal. Like the yes. goal isn't to be like, oh, well, we just want to make you feel bad. The goal is the idea of understanding so that we can move forward with the shared understanding of how we got here. Because if we understand how we got here, we have a better understanding of how to move forward. Yes. Yeah. That's you know, very well said. You know, and so yeah. I think, I think there's that. And then also the other part of it too, is I think, you know, when you touch on people who are closest to the pain, I think of the idea of allyship. Mm-hmm. Okay. So like for myself, I'm, I'm a black woman in those ways. I'll be considered part of marginalized communities as far as gender and race. But when it comes to other aspects, I would be part of more of a dominant community. So like I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual. When it comes to those frameworks, I'm in more of a dominant position. And, you know, part of allyship is instead of taking the lead, instead of like being like, okay, well, I know the answers to everything. And I'm going to tell you how to fix yourself or whatever as the marginalized group. It's like, it's important to listen to, to those who are part of that group. And if it's something that say I'm not doing right. Okay. I'm not using say the right language, or I'm conceptualizing something in a way that is harmful, right. Then instead of being defensive, let me take that in and work to do better moving forward. Yes. Yeah. That's very, very well said. And, you know, to be honest, another impulse from this book has, and this brings us kind of back to the first question you asked is since arriving back in Philadelphia after time away in graduate school, and then my first job at, in a, at Fordham University in New York, coming back to Philadelphia, I got engaged in faith-based organizing. Mm. 
And it has been so incredibly grounding and challenging. And it's the kind of work, it's the kind of change work that I want to be engaged in. But it was um, doing that work with people from different faith traditions or even within my own Catholic tradition of different racial and ethnic backgrounds that I realized how I was not a completely whole person. And therefore, I wasn't because of not reflecting on how I became who I am in terms of my Catholic identity and my white racial identity. And because I had not figured that out, not showing up as a whole person meant I wasn't really being the best ally or the best accomplice in the work that I was so much wanting to do with all these other folks. So part of the impetus, I think, and part of what I I hope to communicate to readers is that um, doing this work, this kind of, you know, asking questions and and putting flesh on the bones or, or planting, seeing where the roots of your family tree, what soils they are in, is actually incredibly liberating because it helps us be become more whole. And in my experience, just helps me to show up better for the people who want me to show up and stand shoulder to shoulder with them in the kind of work that people of faith and those who are not of faith are called to do in terms of of social change work, particularly around racial inequality. Hmm. That's the thing. I love hearing about solutions and I love hearing about like the things that people do to act out their convictions. And one of the things that my understanding is that you're involved in is this group called power. Yes. Yep. What does this group do and how did you become involved in it? Sure. Power is an affiliate of a larger umbrella organization in the United States called Faith in Action. And Faith in Action actually does organizing internationally as well. And it's basically, you know, faith-based community organizing. So it is an approach to social change Um, that is rooted in a kind of a tradition of organizing, some of which comes from the church, some of it which comes from labor movements or, you know, um, more secular um, organizing movements. But it's got some fundamental components that make a lot of sense for communities of faith. So I got involved in it because I was invited by a parishioner in the parish that I belong in that is, you know, one of the few Catholic congregations in power There are lots of Catholic parishes involved in other affiliates around the country, but in Philadelphia, we cannot seem to get um, a groundswell of Catholic parishes. I think part of it has to do with this history that I've uncovered. Um, I shouldn't say uncovered, but I've just kind of been waiting in. Um, But I've done some organizing work then on my own campus and with three other Catholic universities. So educators and students at three universities kind of created this little affiliate called Power University. So we are part of that larger kind of power congregation network here in the city. So power has, you know, much like Faith in Action has some national platforms around immigration reform or criminal justice reform or um, economic justice around wage issues. They, They organize or we organize around climate, climate change issues. So it's just an approach to, to social change that is built, very relational, that starts with one-to-one relationships that people have with one another. And then you build dreams for communities that you are a part of. And then you work to come up with a plan to figure out how to exercise your people power to, to affect change, both at the, at the city level, at the state level, and then also nationally. So And being motivated by the stories of our faith traditions around justice is something that brings everybody together. So it's it's really been something that also, like I said earlier, inspired me to do this work. Because when I started to ask, well, why are there so few Catholic congregations? Why do we have such a hard time getting Catholic parishes? I, you know, I found some answers, um, or I think I found some answers, you know, connected to connected to this history of of race and racism here in the city. So. Part of this is let's undo some of those knots so that we can have more white Catholics um, and predominantly white parishes uh, showing up to do this kind of change work that we need. We need in our cities. We need in our communities. We need in the state of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's that's absolutely awesome. Lastly, what is next for you? Well, (laughs) I mean, the book just came out today. So like. um, it's, I've been so consumed with that. I mean, here's what I'm thinking. I, I think I want to lean in a little bit 
Um, and maybe it might not be a book project, but lean a little bit more into the spiritual dimension of some of what I've talked about in the book. And, you know, figure out how to kind of curate and perhaps offer some spiritual tools. Because the thing, one of the dangers I think white people like myself can run into is we can get really heady and intellectualize this. But so much of racial justice work has to also be about the heart. Um, It has to be about our own stories. And so maybe helping people, white people kind of get out of our heads and down into our hearts, our heart centers. So I think that's something um, another thing is like I encountered this neat woman, Anna McGarry, in the in the Jesu parish when all that segregation was going on in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Yeah, I like I liked her. Like that, that was uh, yeah, that she, that, she, stuck, out, she stuck out to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had so much more about her that I couldn't even put in. Um, so I'm thinking about something with her. And again, like not that it would be a straight up biography, but she is a white lay Catholic woman and white. Catholic women have a particular role to play in how we've arrived in recent history with where we are, knowing the voting patterns of white Catholic women. So, you know, I I think I want to do something. I want to do something with her. I just haven't figured out quite yet what that might be, but um, just a just a really neat, ordinary and yet I think very holy um, person. So those are the those are the things. um, Those are the things I'm thinking. All righty. Listeners, definitely read this book, Undoing the Knots. It's very, it's, I think it was really good, honestly. And it was, <laughs> it, was, it was really fascinating. And I think, especially, especially considering that if you're listening to this show and you know the things that I talk about, then you're, you're going to like this book. I really like the storytelling within it. Where should people go and purchase Undoing the Knots? So I would really love it if people could purchase it from a black owned bookshop in the Northwest corner of Philadelphia, which is where my parish is located and where my university is located. And I live in the kind of right at the edge of that part of Philadelphia. It's called Uncle Bobby's. There is a link to it on my website. And my website is MaureenHOConnell.com. One word, Maureen H. O'Connell. Um, So I'd really love it if we could um, support black owned businesses with um, the purchase of this, but it's also available at all the other kind of usual, usual places. And I think it's, well, I know it's also on audible. So um, if you're somebody who likes to consume your books or engage your books rather that way, it is on audible. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty. So that, that's awesome. Um, I'll make sure that I get the link to uncle Bobby's bookshop in the show notes. Great. Yeah. Great. So, yeah. So people will be able to just go right there and yeah. order that. So that, cool. that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Do you have any like public like social media that you use or anything? I like do. That? I do. Um, I am at Theo Ethics. So again, I can send this to you for the show notes on Twitter at Theo. So imagine Theo, theological ethicist, shortened Theo ethicist. So that's me on Twitter. And then on Instagram, I'm Maureen underscore OC. That would be the place. And then my website would have a place if you to, I'm going to be trying to do a little blog. And if you want to receive like that kind of thing, it'll have, you know, some, some resources, a little theological reflection, a little, you know, things around um, ways of thinking or understanding race, a little bit of art, just something to kind of help continue to invite people into self-exploration. You can sign up there and I can get that to you. Thank you, Maureen, so All much right. for joining me. Like, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And- Hey, thank you, Jay, for your careful read and your really thoughtful conversations. It was a really stimulating time to talk with you. So thanks. Thank you very much for listening to Potstar Podcast. It's a new year and there will continue to be exciting new content released over the course of 2022. So stay tuned. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Prime, or on your favorite podcast app. Go to potstirrerpodcast.com slash download, and you'll see the links. Subscribing will alert you to new episodes once they come out, so you don't have to wait. If you enjoy Potstirrer Podcast, please give it five stars and leave a review. And I'm always on Twitter, so follow me there at PotstirrerCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future, because freedom is not free.